Oh, and welcome back. You've been listening to Dramatic Readings of The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. And we're picking back up for this session with Chapter 4. Let's see how far we get in the time I have from you. One take, keeping it natural, just reading along together. Let's get into it. Chapter 4. Like a newborn child, the magician wept for a long time before he could speak. The poor old woman he whispered at last. The unicorn said nothing, and Schmendrick raised his head and stared at her in a strange way. A gray morning rain was beginning to fall, and she shone through it like a dolphin. No, she said, answering his eyes. I can never regret. He was silent, crouched by the road in the rain, drawing his soaked cloak close around his body until he looked like a broken black umbrella. The unicorn waited, feeling the days of her life falling around her with the rain. "'I can sorrow,' she offered gently, "'but it's not the same thing.' When Schmendrick looked at her again, he had managed to pull his face together, but it was still struggling to escape from him. "'Where will you go now?' he asked. "'Where are you going... Uh, "'Where were you going when she took you?' "'I was looking for my people,' the unicorn said. Have you seen them, magician? They are wild and sea white like me. Schmendrick shook his head gravely. I've never seen anyone like you, not while I was awake. There were supposed to be a few unicorns left when I was a boy, but I knew only one man who had ever seen one. They're surely gone, lady, all but you. When you walk, you make an echo where they used to be. No, she said for others have seen them. It gladdened her to hear that there had still been unicorns as recently as the magician's childhood. She said, A butterfly told me of the red bull, and the witch spoke of King Haggard. So I'm going wherever they are to learn what they know. Can you tell me where Haggard is king? The magician's face almost got away, but he caught it and began to smile very slowly as though his mouth had turned to iron. He bent it to the proper shape in time, but it was an iron smile. I can tell you a poem, he said, where all the hills are lean as knives and nothing grows, not leaves nor lives, where the hearts, where hearts are sour as boiled beer. Haggard is the ruler here. I will know when I get there, then, she said, thinking that he was mocking her. Do you know any poems about the Red Bull? There are none, Smendrick answered. He rose to his feet, pale and smiling. About King Haggard I only know what I have heard, he said. He's an old man, stingy as late November, who rules over a barren country by the sea. Some say that the land was soft and green once, but Haggard came. Oh, before Haggard came... But he touched it, and it withered. There's a saying among farmers, when they look at a field lost to fire or locusts or the wind, as blighted as Haggard's heart. They say also that there are no lights in his castle, and no fires, and that he sends his men out to steal chickens and bedsheets and pies from window sills. The story has it that the last time King Haggard laughed, the unicorn stamped her foot. Schmendrick said, as for the Red Bull, I know less than I have heard, for I've heard too many tales, and each argues with another. The bull is real. The bull is a ghost. The bull is Haggard himself when the sun goes down. The bull was in the land before Haggard, or it came with him, or it came to him. These are literally all things he says. It protects him from raids and revolutions and saves him the expense of arming his men. It keeps him a prisoner in his own castle. It is the devil to whom Haggard has sold his soul. It is the thing he sold his soul to possess. The bull belongs to Haggard. Haggard belongs to the bull. The unicorn felt a shiver of sureness spreading through her, widening from the center like a ripple. In her mind, the butterfly piped again. They passed down all the roads long ago, and the red bull ran close behind them and covered their footprints. She saw white forms blowing away in the bellowing wind and yellow horns shaking. 
I will go there, she said. Magician, I owe you a boon, for you set me free. What would you have of me before I leave you? Smendrick's long eyes were glinting like leaves in the sun. Take me with you. She moved away, cool and dancing, and she did not answer. The magician said, I might be useful. I know the way into Haggard's country and the languages of the lands between here and there. The unicorn seemed very near to vanishing into the sticky mist, and Smendrick hurried on. Besides, no wanderer was ever the worse for a wizard's company, even a unicorn. R remember the tale of the great wizard Nikos? Once in the woods he beheld a unicorn sleeping with his head in the lap of a giggling virgin. With three, hundred, with three hunters advanced with drawn bows to slay him for his horn, Nikos had only a moment to act. With a word and a wave, he changed the unicorn into a handsome young man, who woke and, seeing the astonished bowmen gaping there, charged upon them and killed them all. His sword was a, of a twisted, tapering design, and he trampled the bodies when the men were dead. And the girl? the unicorn asked. Did he kill the girl, too? No, he married her. He said she was only an aimless child, angry at her family and that all she really needed was a good man, which he was, then and always, for even Nikos could never give him back his first form. He died old and respected, of a surfeit of violets, some say. He never could get enough violets. There were no children. The story lodged itself somewhere in the unicorn's breath. The magician did him no service, but great ill, she said softly. How terrible it would be if all my people had been turned human by well-meaning wizards, exiled, trapped in burning houses. I would sooner find that the Red Bull had killed them all. Where you are going now, Smendrick answered, few men will, a will, f a few will mean you anything but evil, and a friendly heart, however foolish, may be as welcome as water one day. Take me with you, for laughs, for luck, for the unknown. Take me with you. The rain faded as she spoke. As he spoke, the sky began to clear, and the wet grass glowed like the inside of a seashell. The unicorn looked away, searching through a fog of kings for one king, and through a snowy glitter of castles and palaces for one built on the shoulders of a bull. No one has ever traveled with me, she said, but then no one ever caged me before, or took me for a white mare, or disguised me as myself. Many things seem determined to happen to me for the first time, and your company will surely not be the strangest of, strangest of them, nor the last. So you may come with me, if you like, though I wish you had asked me for some other reward." Smendrick smiled sadly. I thought about it. He looked at his fingers, and the unicorn saw the half-moon marks where the bars had bitten him. But you never could have granted my true wish. There it is, the unicorn thought, feeling the first spidery touch of sorrow on the inside of her skin. That is how it will be to travel with a mortal, all the time. No, she replied. I cannot turn you into something you are not, no more than the witch could. I cannot turn you into a true magician. I didn't think so, Smendrick said. It's all right. Don't worry about it. I'm not worrying about it, the unicorn said. A blue jay swooped low over them on the first day of their journey, said, Well, I'll squab under glass. Well, I'll be a squab under glass and flipped straight home to tell his wife about it. She was sitting on the nest, singing to their children in a dreary drone. Spiders and sow bugs and beetles and crickets, slugs from the roses and ticks from the thickets, grasshoppers, snails, and a quail's egg or two, all to be regurgitated for you. Lullaby, lullaby, swindles and schemes, Flying's not near as much fun as it seems. Just made that up, sorry. <laughs> it's not in the movie, so I don't have no idea. And this is two blue jays talking. I guess they can sing and everything, just like the butterfly. Okay, we get it. Animals talk in this land. 
saw a unicorn today, the blue jay said as he lit. You didn't see any supper, I noticed, his wife replied coldly. I hate a man who talks with his mouth empty. Baby, a unicorn, the jay abandoned his casual air and hopped up and down on the branch. I haven't seen one of those since the time. You've never seen one, she said. This is me, remember? I know what you've seen in your life and what you haven't. The jay paid no attention. There was a strange-looking party in black with her, he rattled. They were going over Cat Mountain. I wonder if they were heading for Haggard's country. He cocked his head to the artistic angle that had first won his wife. What a vision for old Haggard's breakfast, he marveled. A unicorn coming to call, bold as you please, rat-tat-tat on his dismal door. I'd give anything to see. I suppose the two of you didn't spend the whole day watching unicorns, his wife interrupted with a click of her beak. At least, I understand that she used to be considered quite imaginative in matters of spare time. She advanced on her, him, her neck, feathers ruffling. Honey, I haven't even seen her, the blue jay began, and his wife knew that he didn't, that he hadn't, and wouldn't dare. But she batted him one way, batted him one anyway. She was one woman who knew what to do with a slight moral edge. Nice little vignette there. The unicorn and the magician walked through the spring, over soft cat mountain and down into a violet valley where the apples grew. Beyond the valley were low hills, as fat and docile as sheep, lowering their heads to sniff at the unicorn in wonder as she moved among them. After these came the slower heights of summer, and the baked plains where the air hung shiny as candy. Together she and Smendrick forded rivers, scrambled up and down brambly banks and bluffs, and wandered in woods that reminded the unicorn of her home, though they could never resemble it, having known time. So has my forest now, she thought. So has my forest now, she thought. But she told herself that it did not matter, that all would be as before when she returned. At night, while Smendrick slept the sleep of a hungry, footsore magician, the unicorn crouched awake, waiting to see the vast form of the red bull come charging out of the moon. At times she caught what she was sure was his smell, a dark, sly reek easing through the night, reaching out to find her. Then she would spring to her feet with a cold cry of readiness, only to find two or three deer gazing at her from a respectful distance. Dear love and envy, unicorns. Once a buck, in his second summer, prodded forward by his giggling friends, came quite close to her and mumbled without meeting her eyes, You're very beautiful. You're just as beautiful as our mothers said. The unicorn looked silently back at him, knowing that he expected no answer from her. The other deer sniggered and whispered, Go on, go on. Then the buck raised his head and cried out swiftly and joyously, But I know someone more beautiful than you. He wheeled and dashed away in the moonlight. and His friends followed him. The unicorn lay down again. Now and then in their journey, they came to a village, and there Smendrick would introduce himself as a wandering wizard, offering, as he cried in the streets, to sing for my supper, to bother you just a little bit, and to trouble your sleep ever so slightly, and pass on. Few were the towns where he was not invited to stable his beautiful white mare and stay the night, and before the children went to bed he would perform in the market square by lantern light. He never actually attempted any greater magic than making dolls talk and turning soap into sweets, even this trifling sorcery sometimes slipped from his hands. But the children liked him, and their parents were kindly with supper, and the summer evenings were lithe and soft. Ages after, the unicorn still remembered the strange chocolate stable smell, and Schmendrick's shadow dancing on the wall, walls and doors and chimneys in the leaping light. In the mornings, they went on their way, Smendrick's pockets full of bread and cheese and oranges, and the unicorn pacing beside him. Sea white in the sun, sea green in the dark of the trees. His tricks were forgotten before he was out of sight, but his white mare troubled the nights of many a villager, and there were women who woke weeping from dreams of her. One evening they stopped in a plump, 
comfortable town where even the beggars had double chins and the mice waddled. Smendrick was immediately asked to dinner with the mayor and several of the rounder councilmen, and the unicorn, unrecognized as always, was turned loose into in a pasture where the grass grew sweet as milk. Dinner was served out of doors at a table in the square, for the night was warm and the mayor was pleased to show off his guest. It was an excellent dinner. During the meal, Smendrick told stories of his life as an errant enchanter, filled it with kings and dragons and noble ladies. He was not lying, merely organizing events more sensibly, and so his tales had a taste of truth even to the canny councilmen. Not only they, but all manner of folk passing in the street leaned forward to understand the nature of the spell that opened all locks, if properly applied. And there was not but not a one but lost a breath at sights of the marks on the magician's fingers. Souvenir of my encounter with a harpy, Smendrick explained calmly. They bite. And were you never afraid? A young girl wondered softly. The mayor made a shooing noise at her, but Smendrick lit a cigar and smiled at her through the smoke. Fear and hunger have kept me young, he replied. He looked around at the circle of dozing, rumbling councilmen and winked widely at the girl. The mayor was not offended. It's true, he sighed, caressing his dinner with linked fingers. We do lead a good life here, or if we don't, I don't know anything about it. I sometimes think that a little fear, a little hunger might be good for us. Sharpen our souls, so to speak. That's why we always welcome strangers with tales to tell and songs to sing. They broaden our outlook, set us to looking inward. He yawned and stretched himself, gurgling. One of the councilmen suddenly remarked, My word, look at the pasture. Heavy heads turned on, the no turned on nodding necks, and all saw the village's cows and sheep and horses clustered at the far end of the field, staring at the magician's white mare, who was placidly cropping the cool grass. No animal made a noise. Even the pigs and geese were as silent as ghosts. A crow called once, far away, and his cry drifted through the sunset like a single cinder. Remarkable, the mare murmured. Most remarkable. Yes, isn't she, the magician agreed. If I were to tell you some of the offers I've had for her. The interesting thing, said the councilman who had spoken first, is that they don't seem to be afraid of her. They have an air of awe, as though they were doing her some sort of reverence. They see what you have forgotten how to see. Smendrick had drunk his share of red wine, and the young girl was staring at him with eyes both sweeter and shallower than the unicorn's eyes. He thumped his glass on the table and told the smiling mare, She is a rarer creature than you dare to dream. She is a myth, a memory, a will-o'-the-wisp, whale-o'-the-wisp. If you remembered, if you hungered, his voice was lost in a gust of hoofbeats and the clamor of children. A dozen horsemen, dressed in autumn rags, came galloping into the square, howling and laughing, scattering the townsfolk like marbles. They formed a line and clattered around the square, knocking over whatever came in their way and shrieking incomprehensible brags and challenges to no one in particular. One rider rose in his saddle, bent his bow, and shot the weathercock off the church spire. Another snatched up Smendrick's hat, jammed it on his own head, and rode on, roaring. Some swung screaming children to their saddle bows, and others contented themselves with wineskins and sandwiches. Their eyes gleamed madly in their shaggy faces, and their laughter was like drums. The round mare stood fast until he caught the eye of the raider's leader. Then he raised one eyebrow. The man snapped his fingers, and immediately the horses were still, and the ragged men as silent as the village animals before the unicorn. They put the children gently on the ground and gave back most of the wineskins. "'Jack Jingley, if you please,' the mayor said calmly. The leader of the horsemen dismounted and walked slowly towards the table where the councilmen and their guests had dined. He was a huge man, nearly seven feet tall, 
and at every step he rang and jangled because of the rings and bells and bracelets that were sewn to his patched jerkin. "'Evening, Your Honor,' he said in a gruff chuckle. "'Let's uh, get this business over with,' the mayor told him. "'I don't see why you can't come riding in quietly like civilized people.' "'Ah, the boys don't mean no harm, Your Honor,' the giant grumbled good-naturedly. "'Cooped up in the greenwood all day. "'They they needs a little relaxing, a little catharsis-like. "'Well, well to it, eh?' "'With a sigh, he took a wizened bag of coins from his waist "'and placed it in the mayor's open hand. "'There you be, Your Honor,' said Jack Jingly. "'It bain't much, but we can't spare no more than that.' The mayor poured the coins into his palm and pushed at them with a fat finger, grunting. It certainly isn't much, he complained. It isn't even as much as last month's take, and that was shriveled enough. You're a woeful lot of freebooters, you are. It's hard times, Jack Jingley answered sullenly. We bain't to blame if travelers have no more gold than we. You can't squeeze blood out of a turnip, you know. I can, the mayor said. He scowled savagely and shook his fist at the giant outlaw. "'And if you're holding out on me,' he shouted, "'if you're feathering your own pockets at my expense, "'I'll squeeze you, my friend. "'I'll squeeze you to a pulp and peel and let the wind take you. "'Be off now and tell it to your tattered captain. "'Away, villains!' "'As Jack Jingley turned away, muttering, "'Smendrick cleared his throat and said hesitantly, <clears throat> "'I'll have my hat, if you don't mind.' The giant stared at him out of bloodshot buffalo eyes, saying nothing. "'My hat,' Smendrick requested in a firmer voice. "'One of your men took my hat, and it would be wise for him to return it.' The wine was still leaping in Smendrick's own eyes. "'I am Smendrick the magician, and I make a bad enemy,' he declared. "'I am older than I look, and less amiable. My hat!' Jack Jingley regarded him a few moments, moments longer, then he walked back to his horse, stepped over it, and sat down in the saddle. He rode forward until he was hardly a beard's thickness from the waiting Smendrick. Nah, then, he boomed. If you be a magician, do some a tricksy. Turn my nose green, fill my saddlebags with snow, disappear my beard, show me some magic, or show me your heels. He pulled a rusty dagger from his belt and dangled it by the point, whistling maliciously. The magician is my guest, but Smendrick said solemnly, Very well, on your head be it. Making sure, with the edge of his eye, that the young girl was watching him, he pointed at the scarecrow, scarecrow crew grinning behind their leader and said something that rhymed. Instantly, his black hat snatched itself from the fingers of the man who held it and floated swole slowly through the darkening air, silent as an owl. Two women fainted, and the mayor sat down. The outlaws cried out in children's voices, oh! Down the length of the square sailed the black hat as far as a, ho as far as a horse trough, where it dipped low and scooped itself full of water. Then, almost invisible to the shadows, he came drifting back, apparently aiming straight for the unwashed head of Jack Jingley. He covered himself, covered himself with his hands, muttering, "Nah, nah, call it off!" And even his own men snickered in anticipation. Smendrick smiled triumphantly and snapped his fingers to hasten the hat. But as it neared the outlaw leader, the hat's flight began to curve gradually at first, then much more sharply as it bent towards the councilman's table. The mayor had just time to lunge to his feet before the hat settled itself comfortably on his head. Smendrick ducked in time, but a couple of the closer councilmen were slightly spattered. In the roar of laughter, varying voluntary, varyingly voluntary, that went up, Jack Jingley leaned from his horse and swept up Smendrick the magician, who was trying to dry the spluttering mare with a tablecloth. I misdoubt you'll be asked for encores, the giant bellowed in his ear. Ye'd best come with us. He threw Smendrick's face down across his saddle bow and galloped away, followed by his shabby cohorts. Their snorts and belches and guffaws lingers guffaws lingered in the square long after the sound of hooves had died away. Men came rushing to ask the mayor if they should pursue the, to rescue the magician. 
but he shook his wet head, saying, "'I hardly think it will be necessary. "'If our guest is the man he claims to be, "'he should be able to take care of himself quite well. "'And if he isn't, why then an impostor "'taking advantage of our hospitality "'has no claim on us for assistance? "'No, no, never mind about him.' "'Creeks were running down, the, down his jowls "'to join the brooks of his neck "'and the river of his shirt-front.' but he turned his placid gaze towards the pasture where the magician's white mare glimmered in the darkness. She was trotting back and forth before the fence, making no sound. The mare said softly, I think it might be well to take good care of our departed friend's mount, since he evidently prized her so highly. He sent two men to the pasture with instructions to rope the mare and put her in the strongest stall of his own stable. But the men had not yet reached the pasture gate when the white mare jumped the fence and was gone into the night like a falling star. The two men stood where they were for a time, not heeding the mare's commands to come back, and neither ever said, even to the other, why he stared after the magician's mare so long. But now and then, after that, they laughed with wonder in the middle of very serious events and so came to be considered frivolous sorts. What do you think that's all about? Perhaps they recognized her at the last moment as being a unicorn. And that's the chapter, folks. How about that? We made it to chapter five. Thanks so much for listening to me. Uh, the story of The Last Unicorn by Rankin Bass was, uh, the video, the movie, rather, um, was one of my favorites. Maybe it was for you, too. Love getting to pick up all the little bits and pieces that maybe didn't make it into the movie that are in the book, even though the movie is incredibly faithful to the book. You must notice if you've seen the movie. So thanks for sticking with me. Subscribe. If you haven't already, you'll get instant updates as I read more chapters. Leave me a comment, feedback, how you think I'm doing. And it's just a pleasure to enjoy great stories by great authors with you all. Thanks, and we'll see you on the next one.